for listening to the Finding Careers in podcast. I'm Pete Newsom, and today's guest is extra special. All of them are special, but this one is extra special because it's it's my older brother, Rich Newsom. How are you today? I'm doing great, Pete. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about today. Well, thank you for joining. It's very generous of you. I know how busy you are, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time because this podcast is all about how success happens, and you're someone who I've watched become very successful over the years. Um, it's It's been easy to see, but not easy to do, um, for sure. So I was hoping to have an opportunity to talk to you about that today and to better understand how that happened, you know, why you versus someone else. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to, um, I'd like to explore some of that over the next hour. No, that sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. So I told you before we started recording that I was not going to read your bio and I'm not, but there's some things that it's a very long list of accomplishment accomplishments, by the way, it would probably fill up most of the time if I wanted to read it, but I think it makes sense to set the stage a little bit with some highlights. You graduated from University of, Law, uh, University of Florida Law School in 1989, went to work for the U.S. Attorney's Office. I want to hear more about how you came into private practice and starting your own firm, but just to highlight some of your accomplishments. In 2009, uh, you were recognized for having two of the largest top uh, two of the 100 largest verdicts in the nation in 2018. You're a founding member of Trial School Incorporated. You want to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, you've been uh, one of the top 100 trial lawyers named by National Trial Lawyers uh, Association from 2013 to present, the Summit Council from 2012 to present, U.S. News Best Law Firms from 2011 to present. I could keep going. That is just a, a, a few of, a, like I said, a very long list of accomplishments. So I think it's safe to say objectively that you've been pretty good at what you do. Is that fair? You know, I, as some would say, <laughs> yeah, but no, I, you know, I, it's one of the things I want to talk about today. I found my why. And when you find your why, it's really, and you know, I know Pete, you and I've talked before about how uh, sometimes some of the candidates, they want to find their purpose and that's more important. But I think it's not necessarily purpose. I would call it your why. And I'll talk about that. And I think if you can find that, at least for me, that's what keeps me getting up and doing what I'm doing. I mean, we were talking about a friend of mine. I had lunch with this guy's like in his late seventies and you know, he's retired two or three times. He's bought and sold six banks. And uh, I was talking to him today at lunch. I'm like, you know, well, why are you, you know, what's, have you ever tried retiring? He goes, oh yeah, I tried, tried, tried retiring years ago. Last about nine months and I almost got a divorce. And he started laughing. He goes, I, I, I love this. You know, he likes doing what he's doing. He's, a, he, he, he's the president and owner of a bank and his friends are his clients. And it just brings him joy watching his friends build businesses in a way that he can help them. That's just one example of someone who found their why and said, will never stop coming into the office because for him, it's not work. Right. It's his purpose. It's his why. And he just, he gets a kick out of it. And when you meet him, he just exudes good energy and happiness and just, you know, brings that joy to everybody. It makes you want to do business with this guy. So, sure. So well, I, think- I one of the things that, that's become clear to me since starting this podcast, you know, the, the title, of course, Finding Careers In, is that it's not necessarily about financial reward. It's not about a title or any specific accomplishment. It's a very, success is a very personal thing and it doesn't happen um, by coincidence, it doesn't happen by accident, but it has to be meaningful to the individual. And, and I, and that sounds like what you're describing with, uh, with the guy you had lunch with today. Yeah. There, you know, a lot of people um, may roll their eyes when I say this, but um, I started studying, um, you know, I'm a trial lawyer, right? I talk to people for a living. And I try to develop what's called rapport with them so that you can have some level of trust so that you're not coming across as the sleazy ambulance chaser that they sometimes look at you uh, with, with with the idea of when you walk into the door. And so I've studied this, I've studied influence and there's a lot of science behind influence. And there's a sort of this little dark corner of influence that a lot of the social scientists still frown upon. The father was a guy by the name of Milton Erickson who was this famous psychiatrist that was just, I've watched videotapes. There's some of the surviving videotapes, not a lot. Uh, there's recordings of him, but this guy was just a magician. And he was one of the first ones very accomplished, well-respected psychiatrist who started studying hypnosis. Uh, and, you know, again, this sounds kind of hokey and it's a pseudoscience and now automatically I can hear the eyes rolling as people listen to this podcast. 
But this guy was a genius and he's sort of legendary within the world of, of psychiatry. There's been a lot of studies that have proved the, the efficacy of psychiatry when, and, and psychotherapy was con- combined with hypnosis. But I wanted to study this guy. So I went and I became actually a certified hypnosis, uh, hypnotist, which you know, there's a lot of hoke along with it, but there's some validity to some of it. And then there's another guy who studied it and is probably the most famous motivational speaker of all time. It's Tony Robbins. And again, I can hear the eyes rolling, but I wanted to study Robbins. I'd heard that he had studied hypnosis and had studied this stuff called neuro-linguistic programming. And what is that all about? And so I've, I've attended some of his courses just to witness it. And the guy's super charismatic and super powerful. And when you listen to him, you just sort of get swept away in his oratory and uh, the, the, this guy's presence. But one of the things that he rings home is that it, he, gives, he gives this very well-known course that actually I can't remember the guy's name, the CEO who founded Salesforce, gives Robbins a lot of credit for helping him build his company. He's been to all the Robbins stuff, has been a friend, personal friend of, of, of Tony's for years. There's a lot of other huge billionaires who are you know, Tony Robbins you know, guys. So, so I was interested in hearing about it. And so I went to this thing called Business Mastery. And it's a five day course and I'm not pushing it, but one of the things that rang through and through with this whole thing was something that struck a chord with me. When you're trying to decide what you're gonna do for a career or for a job or for whatever it might be, if you can find your why, that's where it starts. Why, what, what wakes me up in the morning? What is my purpose? What is my mission that, that, that lights me up? Uh, there's another guy named Walt Hampton who wrote a great book, uh, who's, a, who's a, a, a very successful lawyer who, who is a mentor of mine. And he said, if, if you can find your fire, and that's a really hard thing to do, and you have to discern, and you really have to search and try to you know, give yourself space and time to figure that out. But man, if you can, it changes everything. Then you never go to work another day in the rest of your life. I mean, I could retire, I could have retired years ago. I just choose not to because what fires me up and gets me up in the morning every day is my personal mission and my personal why. So you know, it's an incredibly powerful thing if you can achieve it, right? And I think yeah, that's, that's, that's the hard part probably. But you know, going back a little bit, um, you know, when, you, when you decided to go to law school initially, did, did, you, did, you, did you have that feeling then? Uh, or, or were you thinking something altogether different? Oh yeah, it changed. I mean, when I was in law school, I, I thought foolishly I wanted to run for public office and that's what I wanted to do. And actually it was, you know, our father, when I was in 10th grade said, I think you'd make a good lawyer. And it was, you know, wow, my dad thinks I could be a lawyer. That sounded really cool to me. I didn't even know a lawyer. And so that was sort of my, my, my dad's great inspiration sort of started me down the path of, of the law. And that was sort of my aptitude. I could stand up in front of a crowd. I used to, you know, did debate club and read at church in front of a bunch of people. And I kind of enjoyed that, but it wasn't until later that I really figured out what made me tick. I did figure out at some point that, you know, I did not want to run for public office. That was not my thing, but ultimately found, you know, a mission that, that was, that rang, rang to my values where I had come from as a human being, as a person uh, from a family that, um, you know, was a middle-class family. We had such great values growing up. And, you know, our mom was a teacher. Our dad was a project manager. They worked hard and they provided, we were a family's family. And, um, and so for me, ultimately, and I can tell the story of how it happened, but um, I found sort of my purpose uh, and my why sort of going back to who, who and where I came from. And it just all clicked for me at some point. And, and, you know, man, it's, it's been a great ride. Can, can do, you, do you know when exactly that happened or did it evolve over time? No, it, yeah. So, so I go to law school, uh, you know, I, I, I was on the moot court team, which I, I realized, oh, I think I could be a good trial lawyer. I'm really good at this thing. I'd gotten some awards in law school. So I thought, okay, I want to be a trial lawyer because that's kind of what I'm good at. And then I'll do that for a while and then I'll run for office after I make some money, right? So uh, I thought, well, if I want to be a trial lawyer, I want to get some experience. So I went to where I weaseled my way into the Department of Justice, which back then they had an age requirement. And again, a lot of it is, is if, if once you set your sights, you know, this, this manifestation thing, and again, the eyes roll, right, when you talk about that, because there is, it sounds kind of silly, but I decided this is what I'm going to do, and I set my mind out to it. I had no experience. I did not even have a law, I had a law degree, but I didn't wasn't a member of the bar yet because I hadn't passed it. I had to take it, you know, and then wait for the results. But 
I, I worked, con- I, our family had no connections, but I'd made connections through the political world and the guy who was the US attorney needed help from a guy I was friends with. So I weaseled my way in literally as a 24 year old, third year law student right out of law school, not even a member of the bar. I'm holding down a position as an assistant United States attorney because I wanted to get trial experience. And so going back a little bit, when I was in law school, um, there's this, there's this incredible book written by, by this guy named Napoleon Hill. And uh, Napoleon Hill wrote this book, I think, gosh, in the 40s, maybe. Um, but but he, he, he wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich. And I read that book when I was uh, a second year law student, and it really changed my life. And I, I encourage anybody listening to this, if you want to really read something that can change your path, read this book. It's not long. It's easy to read. It's, I don't know, maybe 150, 200 pages. Uh, but, but for me, it was this thing that set your goal. What do you want? And at the time, it's like, well, I want to be a successful trial lawyer by the time I'm 30. So I got six years to do it. Okay, what I, well, then I can have enough money to run for office. But, but what, what Hill said is to visualize what that feels like. What does it look like? Be tangible with it. Do what kind of, how much money do I want to make? Put a figure on it. How much do I want to have in the bank? What is my house going to look like? Do I have a house? Where do I want to live? Do you want to be married? Do you want to have kids? What kind of stuff do you have? Do you want to have? You want to have a car? What color is it? I mean, be really granular and write it down and put a date on it. I want to buy, by the time I'm 30, this is what I want to have. I still got that list. And I was probably, gosh, 21, 22 years old. And I read that stupid book. It's not stupid. Uh, I've read it a couple times. I actually have a stack of three or four of them on my shelf and I give it out to young lawyers that I work with. I gave it out to my daughter's boyfriend uh, who was asking. So I would encourage anyone listening to this, buy this book. It's a, it's an easy read and this guy's legendary. There are blogs about Napoleon Hill, Google Napoleon Hill. Sure. And you'll see people talking about him on YouTube, but th- th- without giving it all away, come up with something tangible and then work backwards and your mind will figure it out. And so I knew that, all right, well, I want to be a trial lawyer. I want to make all this money by the time I'm 30. So, well, but to do that, I need trial experience. Well, to get trial experience, if I go to work for these big firms, they're not letting young lawyers try cases. Well, then I need to prosecute or be a public defender. Well, but gosh, if you work for the state, they give you lots of cases and it's really not good experience unless you can go with the federal prosecutors. Ooh, that's really good experience. They make you write briefs. You get to argue your own cases on appeal. It's federal court. That's real big boy litigation. Great experience, but impossible to get that job to most people coming out of law school because you got to have a minimum of two years experience. So they usually hire senior prosecutors out of the state or out of the military. So I kind of weaseled my way into that job because I decided that that was the job that I wanted. I had no family connections but I had connections that I kind of developed and worked on. And I'm suggesting that if you've got a dream job or some place you want to be, you're figure out the why first, what am I doing this for? Well, I knew at the time I wanted to have a certain amount of money in the bank so I could do something else and then work backwards, but you've got to be very granular about it and start out with the why. And, and golly, if you work hard enough and put in the time and put in the creativity where you're when you wake up at four in the morning, you're thinking about it and you wake up in the morning, and you're excited about it, man, you can do anything. And I know that sounds hokey, but it's true. You really can do anything if you put your well, mind to it, it. You know, I don't, I don't think it does. And I think that, you know, the books you know, behind me here, you know, there's some uh, similar message in, in almost all of them or any of the business books that I have. And, um, you know, when I talk to young people, I, I, it, I, the one piece of advice that I will give, and I think, you know, when we've talked about this in the past, it, parents give awful advice, generally things like go get a job, right? <laughs> Which is just oh, the a, worst a demoralizing thing for a young oh. person to hear. And, you know, what I say to them and you know, similarly, I think to what you're saying is the whatever the thing is that you wake up thinking about, if you have all the free time in the world uh, and you can do anything that day, if you can figure out a way to just go deep and far in that direction, that would be the best of all worlds. You know, now if if you know it has to it has to have some value in the world, of course, <laughs> whatever this thing is. But you know, I'm I'm a huge believer that uh that 
youth you know, of our of our world gets such bad information and and bad advice in that regard because no one is thinking beyond you know tomorrow where you really should be thinking 10 years from now 20 years from now because it Absolutely. sounds to me like that that's yeah. that's the message you're giving as much as anything else yeah for sure you got to reverse engineer it, but start with why what makes your heart sing if it's money uh, or if it's owning your own business or whatever, write it down and be crystal clear to your brain. Um, and, and, and then everything, you know, one of the things to your point about the bad advice, uh, Napoleon Hill talks about this, uh, gosh, in the 1940s or whenever he wrote this darn book, he said, most people go through life being taught, go to school, get a job, they get their job, they work, whatever they work, they come home at 5 36 o'clock. They watch, and I will, I'll never forget. They said they watch a little TV and then they go to bed. So maybe that was in the 1950s. And that's kind of it. And that's such, that's terrible advice. And we're institutionalized to that, right? When we're little, you go to class, you study, you make good grades. Yay, you get rewarded. And all the, oh, I see this in the legal industry for all the time. The, these, these law students, they come through because their whole life they've been making, they've made, been A students. You go through law school and you're an A student. And now you get the big job at the big firm. And you become what one of the managing partners at one of the big firms, I won't name them, one of the big law firms here in, in Florida, I mean, a giant one, got taped in a partnership meeting referring to young associates as fungible production units. And they <laughs> grind them into the ground and they're miserable. And if you look at the incidents of, of, of young lawyers who are unhappy, they're so disillusioned. It's like, wait a minute, I, I made good grades, I did everything and I, I'm, this is miserable. Yeah, because you didn't think about the why. What do I want? And and so whatever it is tangibly and think about what is your life going to look like? What am I going to do for fun? How much time do I want to just slog away working 70 hours in a cubicle or a, an office? You may have a view, but you don't have time to enjoy it. And you go home, you get up in the morning, you go to work, it's dark. You come home, it's dark working for clients that you don't like and really don't care about. Yeah. Wh why do you think, why do you think it's so broken? And then you know, as a follow up to that, what what do you think can be done about that? You know, it, it, it uh, I guess from a, a couple of different perspectives, right? There's a person who's living it, and then there's a, those of us who are trying to guide you know younger younger people, kids, our own, your own children, or or you know, uh, younger folks who work for us. Um, I, I think I, I don't know if you you're familiar with the term that's going around right now, quiet quitting. Have you heard that? Oh, yeah, we had we had a kid we we we, we got quiet quitted. <laughs> We hired this marketing director. We paid him like 160 grand a year. PhD came in all fired up and, and just, yeah, he quite quit on us. And we fired him, what has this kid done? And I said, hey man, I need to meet with you tomorrow. We're letting him work remotely. And uh, he said, oh, well, how about we do it by Zoom? I'm like, no, man, we, we need to come down and have a face-to-face. -face. Um, he goes, okay. I said, I'll see you tomorrow at noon for lunch. We'll go to lunch, have a whole afternoon. We'll re find out where you are on all this stuff. Uh, sends me an email saying, well, I, um, I, I came down with COVID. I'm going to the emergency room. Oh, sure you did. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> turns out one of our, I told my, one of my partners to come and say, yeah, here's his emergency room. He's got a goofy hat on. He's at a, a Broadway show in London <laughs> that day. So yeah, he quite quit on us months before. Well, it's, it's, you know, I, to me, when I hear it, I, I, I was just recording a podcast last week talking about it. I, it. It's awful. And, you know, actually quit. If you are not, if you're in a situation where you view your employer in such a poor light and you think your situation is so bad, escape it immediately because yeah, man. Li life's too short. There's, there's too many great opportunities. Right. And, you know, it really bothers me as I as I think about this almost obsessively these days. How how we got here, and then what can we do about it? Because um, you know, 150 years ago, humans were working from sun up to sundown just to survive. You know, yep. we, and we have gotten so spoiled in some respects where we yeah. think success should should be fast. It should be easy. You know, mm. the concept of work life balance. While I I certainly support it, I I think it's there's a time and a place for everything. And when right. you, what you're describing and, and what I saw of you, I'll just say you were in law school. I'm sorry, you were working for the U.S. Attorney's Office. You went to work there, I believe, right at the time I was starting college and you were in Tallahassee working. I was going to school there. Yep. And I remember you working till, you know, all hours of the night. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do your job. Yeah. And I remember thinking, man, you know, here, here's this guy that, 
that it, you know, is, a, is an attorney and you're working in this fancy, you know, fancy job at, at this really cool environment. And all you do is work. Like, yeah. All right. So, so going back to your deal, but here's, I'll, I'll make this short. Here's the rest of my story and how I found my why. So you know, one of the, one of the great things about purpose is that you're really good at something, right? If you're a great basketball player and you've got that, you just happen to be seven foot two, you just happen to have an amazing three point shot. You may not like basketball when you started out, but man, if you're good at it, and all of a sudden you're getting all these accolades because of your personal aptitude, man, all of a sudden you start to love basketball. And that was me being a trial lawyer. I happened to have the aptitude to be good at it. And it was really cool. I came into this job to get the experience. I ended up turning out, I get to represent the United States of America. I get to be in federal court as the young guy having the FBI coming to me for search warrants. I mean, I was like, you know, the U.S. Attorney's Office is the top of the law enforcement food chain. It was a rush. The cops loved me. I was this kid who I didn't have a girlfriend. I wasn't married. I would work. I would get to go on search warrants at night, dressed up with the SWAT team, jumping out of vans. It was awesome. It was like I'm getting to play, you know, cops and robbers with these guys who, you know, kissed my butt because I could get them a search warrant and I could do federal grand juries. It was wonderful. And so I did that for a while. And it was fun. I mean, because I was good at it too. I'd get up and talk to juries, and I was never great. In, I, mean, I was okay in law school, but I was pretty good at talking to juries because I came from a normal family and, you know, had been taught, you know, how to be a good person. And so it kind of worked. And so then I go to work after a while for this giant law firm because I only I wanted to make a little more money and start to feather. And, and, and none of the really great, um, well, actually, there was one great offer I had. I got I got recruited uh, by this firm in Orlando that represented a lot of these. It was a, a big silk stocking firm, and we represented international corporations, manufacturers. It was a boutique product liability defense firm, and they represented the big automakers and the big chemical companies, and they defended them when there were allegations of defective products, and they were offered me so much money because I could try cases. So it was taking my personal talent, what I happened to be good at, that I kind of liked, and they're going to throw a lot of money. Man. How cool is this? So I go, I get this giant office next to the senior part because I could try cases because I made a lot less money because I took a step back to get the experience. So for me, it wasn't about the money from day one. And now all of a sudden, I'm leapfrogging over my contemporaries because I have tried dozens of cases in federal court. I'd argued, written briefs and argued at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, which as a young kid, you don't get to do that in your 20s typically. So I got the great job, I, the senior partner, I hit it off. He was cool. He was a great trial lawyer. But about a year and a half into it, I am representing one of the major car companies in an allegation of a defective seatbelt. Have I ever told you this case before or this story, Pete? Maybe, but keep going. So we're, you know, I'm still, I, you know, I'd been making, you know, crappy money at, at the, the prosecutor's office and I had student loans. We're trying to build a house. My wife wanted to quit because we're, um, I think she, we had just had, uh, or she had just gotten pregnant, trying to build a house, all this stuff and money's tight, but finally I'm making a little bit of money. She wants to quit her job. She's working at a radio station in sales. And I met this deposition defending this big auto company for a defective seatbelt where a family had lost a two-year-old. And I'm begging this company, come on, we need to settle. This is terrible. No, screw it. We're going to take them to trial. I'm like, all right. So I'm defending this case, representing this giant car company against this little family that had lost their only child. And I'm de deposing the grandparents. They're crying. And it was horrible. And I remember driving home and I called Marcy, my wife. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I can't do it. I said, I got to, and to her credit, she had no clue. She's like, okay, whatever. I got gotcha. you. I'll keep working. <laughs> and took a massive cut in pay because I wanted to be the guy on the other side of the table. I wanted to be representing that family. And it felt dirty what I was doing. I was using my talents. The other guy on the other side was a nice guy, but I was beating the snot out of him. I mean, he just, he was a nice guy, but he was not an A-level trial lawyer. Sure. And so I took this huge cut and pay, joined a little guy and started knocking on doors to other, you know, who ran the red light lawyers, uh, TV advertisers, one in particular guy who was a, a actually it was John Morgan, Morgan Morgan was a dear friend of mine, gave me a lot. He said, look, we don't want to mess with these product cases. And for 15 years, I did all of John Morgan's 
defective product stuff. So I formed this little boutique firm going against these companies that I had previously represented. And it just felt so right. And then within, you know, five or 10 years, well, within five years, I was doing really great. And then there was the giant crossroads and the crossroads for me um, was against my old client. And um, my, uh, my partner had left, I was trying to buy the firm and uh, left me in a lurch. Uh, I was buying him out and two years into the buy, I said, oh, I think I'm leaving. So I go to my bank and uh, again, now I'm, I'm probably 30, well, maybe 35, 36 years old. And the bank said, yeah, we're going to stick with your old partner. I'm like, well, wait, I've been bringing in all the business for the last six or seven years. Yeah, we don't care. I think my old partner had called and said, don't give him a loan. So I had no money coming in the door. Um, we had just settled a lot of our cases that year. And the way a, a personal injury firm works is you close out the books. So I'd made some decent money, but we're starting the year. And but I knew it was OK because I had my partner had two or three good cases that were going to help carry us over while I had this these two massive trials, both with zero offers, one of which we had, I don't know, three or four hundred thousand dollars in costs. We were accusing Ford Motor Company of making a defective airbag that had killed the single mother and had left this eight year old. And uh, to me, it was a good case, but Ford had won that case against six other trial lawyers, the exact same theory. And now here I am. And then we had another one. It was a poor guy, this this laborer up in Ocala, Florida, who had had his lung chewed up in a defective grain auger. Again, zero offer. They're blaming my guy. So I'm like, well, that's okay, because my partner has these cases. Well, he comes in January 10th after we had bonused everyone. I said, yeah, I think I'm leaving. So I'm like, oh, great. So I had these two massive trials coming up with every penny I had, because the bank was not giving me a loan, every penny I had made the previous five or six years working as a personal injury lawyer, all wrapped up in these two cases. And I remember calling our dad when I had this first big trial against Ford, it was against my old managing partner. And they had seven or eight associates on it down in Fort Lauderdale, living in a hotel room. It was like a three week trial. And uh, I remember calling my dad and said, what am I gonna do? He goes, what do you mean? And I remember almost crying. I, I said, if I, if I lose this trial, I'm going bankrupt. And I'm working seven days a week on this thing. He goes, well, what do you mean you don't know what you're gonna do? I'm like, what do I do? He goes, just do your best. That's all you can do. And I thought, well, if I lose this, I'm, you know, I've lost my firm. So we went down and um, again, now I, I was a, the, the only thing I'm good at in my life really is trying cases. And so we had uh, brought in exemplar vehicles. We had the jury come down in the parking lot and uh, Ford's like, no, you're not going to do this. Well, the judge kind of wanted to hear it. And what I wanted to do was to demonstrate what an airbag is. Now this is back, gosh, probably in 2001, 2002, and airbags were kind of new back then. And the jury, a lot of people thought that an airbag is kind of like a big pillow. Well, an airbag is actually like a shotgun blast. It's a bomb that explodes and it hits you in the face like a baseball bat. And so we brought the jury down and we had the actual crash vehicle where this poor lady had died because the airbag deployed when it shouldn't have. It was too low of a speed. And we were saying, look, Ford should only deploy the airbag when it's over a particular speed and this was way too low because it's dangerous and this is in the early days of airbags and ford's like well newsom's right then they're saying every one of our vehicles are defective so that's a really hard argument right so i so said we're going to demonstrate what and we had a brand new vehicle there same model mm -hmm. and we're going to demonstrate members of the jury what this is like and mr zimbauer over here who was a buddy of mine who was a mechanic we had dressed up in a nice lab coat you know, with goggles on, looking very official. He was a mechanic. Um, but we said, okay, we're going to blow this airbag on the count of 10. The judge is there. The whole court per personnel had come down to watch this. By the by way, the way I, as a former technology salesperson who lived by the rule, never do a live demo, I'm, I'm cringing as this story oh, goes on. All of I'm, it. I'm picturing the scene and it's, it's, it's ripe with Oh, you know, it was disaster. Just, so keep going. It was epic drama. I mean, now we had tested it several times before, but there was always that. Um, and, you know, but look, I got nothing to lose at this point. And of course, I'm paying for all of this, uh, you know, for the cars, for the experts. Uh, we flew this guy down from Atlanta uh, on his, of course, he had to fly his private jet. He was the biomechanic. I mean, I've literally got three or $400,000 of my, every, every penny I had in the world was wrapped up into this case. And um, so we go down in the parking lot and, uh, you know, 
Jay winks at me uh, right before. And so the counts 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and Jay fires it on three. And of course, boom, it was like two shotgun blasts. It blew out, shattered the window, and you could smell the smoke. And it was shocking. The jury all jumped. The judge jumped. Everyone's eyes got big as silver dollars. And they all crossed their arms and they looked over at the foreign lawyer with a scowl. <laughs> and the case was over. And I had gotten over. Seth Godin calls that in every business venture. He wrote a great book called The Dip. It's maybe 100 pages. Read it if you haven't. But it talks about this concept that as a business owner, especially if you're in a new business, or whatever it may be, it may be you're with a startup or a new job, there's always the initial zeal and the excitement of, yay, my own thing. But there's going to come a point where the dip is going to happen. And the trick is getting past the dip. And if you can get past that dip, then everything accelerates. And that's how it was for me. The word got out about that trial. Ford got beat on this airbag case where I don't know that they had ever lost an airbag case. This is, again, early, especially a jury trial. And uh, I won the next case, the leg off case. And all of a sudden, you know, I was I was good. I start, was able to hire associates and we got all the costs paid back. And, uh, you know, there have been a couple other tests, but that was my moment. And and the point being, though, what what kept me going was the knowledge that this little eight year old was dependent upon me. And I had put I had chosen to be in this position. Uh, I came from a family that cared about each other and we were always focused on each other and and on those you know family values and people, not the powerful. We were never about that, not the money, not the corporations. We were about real human beings and caring for our neighbors and our family and our friends. And so when I had this sort of the if you look at least my my story arc, going from representing Ford Motor Company uh, in a case where a family lost a two year old, it felt just inherently wrong to me. It was not my place. And so I got in this other place where I was now on the other side of the table representing a child who had lost a mother. What in, in, in what, you know, by all accounts was, you know, almost a, a, a done deal. People had written, I mean, of course, Ford's not going to lose this. But because I had chosen to make this decision to put myself into what was a pretty risky deal, but but where the why was right for me, it's where I needed to be based on my values, my upbringing, my personal skills. And what I mean, if, granted, it was stressful. It was horrifying, but I got a certain joy out of cooking up this way to use creatively. How can I win this? It was where my strengths were. It was where my aptitude was. And we won this case because I figured out my why. And so I guess that's my big message to everybody here. And if you can find that, whatever it may be, the money will take care of itself. The method will take care of yourself. Now you got to put in the elbow grease, you got to bust your ass. But if you're if if your values line up with what you're doing, it's not a job. No more than if you you know, when I was a kid, I, you know, I loved playing high school football, or uh, you love playing video games. It's no different than that, man. It's like, you know, back in the day, I used to be a, a gamer, right? And I loved it. I could spend hours. And if you're in the right position, in the right place based on your why and your values and your purpose, man, it's no different than playing video games. It's fun. It, it, and I know it, that sounds wrong, but no, it's, it doesn't at all. And in, in fact, it's, it's, it's crazy timing. I'm listening uh, on uh, audible right now to a book called the hard thing about hard things by Ben Horowitz. And the chapter that I just listened to yesterday while I was out running is called the struggle. Mm -hmm. And it is, very similar to what you just described, but he talks about is every, every, um, every founder goes through that point in their business where they don't know if they're going to make it. And oh, you know, very similar to what you just described as the dip. And you, you have to, you know, you don't have to go through that, but it certainly shows you who you are <laughs> when you do it, 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 you know, shows if you're made for it, it shows if your business can survive, if it's meant to survive, but you can't do any of that unless it has meaning to you as an individual. That's, a, that's exactly and, correct. And so we come up with lots of words for it, right? Why or purpose or, um, it, it, and it, to me, it's all sort of the same thing is that uh, you, you said it earlier, are you, are you going to wake up excited to do this? Or are you going to do it by choice, not be, 
because you're required to or obligated to. And that to me is as important as anything in all of this is find that thing that you're willing to go all in for. Find the thing that you're willing to take that level of risk to, to achieve, right? Because what more, more could you ask for, right? Than that level of something that's going to bring out that level of commitment. Um, that's when you're going to be at your best. So, and, 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 and to me, you know, sometimes it takes a while to find it. It did for me. I was probably, you know, in my mid thirties before I really found it, it started sort of fumbling through this path of, well, this is what I'm good at. And so for some people, it could be, I want to punch out, uh, and I need to make as much money as possible. I met a friend, um, down the Caribbean. I, I, you know, now I, I, I have a, a boat and I sail. It's, uh, it's great. You meet these most, most amazing people. And a lot of people are young and have punched out. This guy uh, came up with a medical company. He's, gosh, I think I is probably in his late 30s. Super great guy. He's sailing around the world with his family and his wife. Um, I, I, you know, I talked to him about it and he's like, you know, I was just done. So that could be a why. If you say, okay, I'm going to just kill myself. There's, you know, there's a great Reddit subreddit called fat fire i don't know if yeah, you've ever sure. been on that but there's a lot of the folks on fat fire that just crushed it said okay i'm gonna give up the next seven or eight or ten years even and save every penny i'm gonna be frugal so that come this age this is my mark in the sand i'm done well that's a purpose that'll get you up uh maybe for some people uh but for me it was it was finding this place where i get to play robin hood how cool is that so, so why why do you think on that point? It, I mentioned it earlier, and it's it is something that I think about a lot. It, this idea of you know delayed gratification, um, you know, really needing to be embraced at, at some level in order to achieve anything significant. Right? You can get lucky, but you can't count on luck. Yeah, you know, that wouldn't recommend that to anyone. Right. What you can count on is the level of effort you're willing to, to put forth, right? And as you said earlier, you have to have a certain level of aptitude, right? I, if I decide to be the best ballerina in the world, that's good. That's, that's an unrealistic goal. Right. So I have to have potential, you know, in, in whatever it is I choose to do. But, but beyond that, what message do you have? Or why do you think it's so hard for people to grasp that idea that success doesn't come quickly and it doesn't come easily but I, and, you know, and my, all of my experience tells me it's necessary, you know, to put forth that effort over time. Why, why do you think that's such a hard thing to? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe culturally, generationally, there's been a lot of, of uh, there's a great book, I can't remember the name, it's about the different generations and how, for whatever reason, if you look at sort of what's been happening in society when certain people grow up, there's the, and I'm going to mangle this, but it's, uh, you know, hard times make strong men, strong men make good times, good time, uh, good times make weak men and weak men make hard times. Absolutely. I think you got it. Yeah, I think I did, which is a miracle. Uh, but I think sometimes generationally, we, we look at this, you know, the greatest generation went through the, the tail end of the depression and World War II. Holy shit. I mean, <laughs> our grandparents, uh, I remember my grandmother talking about you know, shoe making using cardboard for shoes and and they were a middle class family they were normal and rationing milk and uh, the war and what that meant and that was the greatest generation of all time and today I think we've just really had it easy for a long time and so I think if you attribute it to that we're Tony Robbins talks about pattern recognition and we're in winter now it starts now and so I think bad news good news the bad news it's winter but the good news is i think that a lot of the young people that are about to go through this are going to have the opportunity to turn it around it's going to be by necessity just like our grandparents didn't want to go through the depression or world war ii we're going to have i think a shit storm at least most of the real really smart people that i look up to that think and talk about this agree we are in the beginning of winter and it's going to be, I just think, a royal shit show. And I think it's going to change. So I think a lot of it is if you look at the patterns and the seasonality, uh, we're going to be in, in a season I think is going to toughen a lot of people up. History indicates that that is, that is coming, right? Yeah. So, so I think, though, that to answer your question, I think a lot of it is just sort of the season that we're in 
a lot of the young folks who uh, my children, I mean, and granted, look, it, there's individuals that stand out among this and you can always make the choice. And if you use pattern recognition and you look at whomever you want to be like, it may be a billionaire, it may be an entrepreneur, it may be a small business owner, it may be someone like my friend Aya, who's now a young guy sailing around the world with his little kids on this beautiful carbon fiber gorgeous sailboat with his lovely wife who is a harvard grad lawyer uh, uh doctor um whomever your your role model is recognizing that pattern that almost to i think to a person those people all went through an incredible grind of having to give it up yep. it doesn't come easy and i think anyone who uh, whoever you want to put look at steve jobs look at bill gates Look at my, I mean, whomever it is, they've all bled. And most of them went through a dip or whatever you want to call it. I know, look, I'm, I'm a small, you know, boutique law firm, but I, you know, I look back on my list and I don't, I, I think that if I hadn't have been very specific with what I wanted, I had a real firm grasp on my rudder at a very young age. So I think if you, if you have a, a handle on the direction you want to sail, you, you hold that rudder firm with a mission. And I look back on that list. That was my star that I'd written. I accomplished it all by the time I was in my early 30s. Every one of them. Then you got to come up with a new list. It's like, well, what's next? Well, now, okay, I don't want to run for office because I just kind of grew out of that. Now I want to make a, I want to be like a really great plaintiff lawyer or a lawyer, Charlie, and I work for Ford. Ooh, I don't like that. That doesn't feel right. Let's readjust the rudder. Now what I want to do, well, I want to be the most successful plaintiff lawyer, personal injury lawyer on product liability uh, as there is in the country. Well, I, I, I mean, maybe not the, but certainly one of them, if you, I think, ask my peers, okay, check that off. Now what? Now what? You change it again. Well, now, all right, I've, I've got enough money to retire. I've got a boat. I've got houses. I've got, you know, a bunch of money in the bank. I don't have to do it. Now what? Let's adjust it again. Now yeah, that, that, that's so important. And I, I was just listening to, I wish I could, I can't recall which podcast it was within the last two weeks. And it was, they were, they were telling a story which really resonated with for me, which was a lot of people who venture out to do something, they hit that first level goal. You know, it, it was, I want to start a business. Well, okay, your business survives and you realize you were successful. And then, and then you kind of stop because you didn't have a vision beyond that initial yeah. objective. And I could equate it as I was listening to this, I started equating it to so many different things in my life. One of the things is for me was fitness related where I you know, wanted to um, qualify for and run the Boston Marathon. It was a huge a accomplishment for me personally. It was something I set out to do. I had to work really hard to do it. it took me years to, to get there and I did it and then thought, what now? I didn't have a goal beyond that. Well, 10 years later and 50 pounds later, you know, I, I, I look back and go, I didn't have a goal um, and I didn't have something to strive towards. And I've also realized that in, in, in many aspects of my personal life and my business life where I, um, you know, that, that fire that, that burned to a point, once it goes out, but you, you have to find a way to recapture it. And, and there's so much meaning behind that. And individually, um, you, you, what made me realize, and I, and I've started writing down goals since just, just recently for that very reason, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it by this date. And, um, and then I'm, like you said, I'm going to work backwards from that. I'm going to start with the end in mind and, um, and not lose sight of that. Uh, so I think it's a, such an excellent point to bring up. I'd, I'd suggest a little bit different ways of thinking about this. And again, I, I've become a Tony Robbins believer and I, I used to kind of scoff. Oh, Robbins. <laughs> yeah, but you, but you, you, you said that earlier, he didn't become Tony Robbins without, no. without so everybody that says that has incredible value. everybody. Everybody that says that has never been, if anybody wants, you want to get your world rocked and get some like incredible Ericksonian hypnosis and NLP and just change your life, go to date with destiny. There's actually the first live event he's, you know, he's done Tony 64, but he's still got it. It is 14 hours a day, three or four days in a row. And I promise you, your life will never be the same. And I'm look, I'm not affiliated with him. I, I'm not a part of the organization or anything, but 
it, it, it really helped me sort of codify a lot of these things. Cause I, I you know, I, I did all this stuff and now I'm kind of like, well, what now do I, you know, I went, I think Pete, I told you, I, I, I was like, I'm going to hike the Appalachian trail. Well, I went for 10 days and I got bored and came home. Cause I could, that takes six months to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go. My business is kind of running itself. And I was like, all right, well, well, all right, I, I'm going to go and I'm going to sail the Caribbean for and not come back for a while and just see how that goes. I got bored after, you know, 10 days and I keep coming. So I went to this Robbins thing and he talks about not just goals and to do's, but really start out with what do I want? Really? What do I want? And he talks about, and I, I think at least for me, it was in three separate areas. Your point about the health. First of all, what do I want for me in terms of health? What does that look like? And then there's exercises you can do where you map it out in 10 years is like, if I do these things, if I have a regimen, if I eat well, if I give up alcohol, if I give up caffeine, if I eat clean food, in 10 years, I do that. And I work out five or six days a week. What am I going to look like in 10 years? How am I going to feel? What's that going to mean to my life, to my health, to my longevity? And you think about that and you visualize and there's exercises you can do to really bake it in and see it. It's all about visualization. And then to the con, it's actually, there's a, there's a name for that. I can't remember, but then you say, okay, you go through the same process. What if I don't? And you come up with the mm. worst case scenario. What am I going to look like? How am I going to feel? Am I going to die early? And or even map it out five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And man, when you really visualize it that way, the two tracks, it, 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 I have not missed a day of working out. I've lost weight. I'm in better shape. Again. So that's the first is your health, your personal health bubble, at least for me. Second bubble is relationships, relationships with your friends, with your wife, with your children, whatever it may be. Because a lot of times if we look at our lives in terms of these three concentric rings, there's your health, which is you personally, and, and there's a spiritual component. It's you too, working on me whatever your spirituality is or meditation or whatever it might contemplation and, and, and education, reading health. There's sort of you personally, second bubble is your relationships, your friends, your family, your children, your business colleagues, whomever that is. And you think about that. What, if I, if I, if I really want to improve those relationships, what tangibly do I need to do? And if I do that, what's it going to look like in five or 10 years and picture some, some moment for me, it's like, man, what if I, in 10 years, I'm flying on a private jet with my family and my new grandchildren. <gasps> How great would that be? Sure. So that's relationship. But, but I want to, uh, you know, and then the third is your business or your work and visualize it. What are those? Some of the things we've talked about before. And so you do that and you think about, okay, five, 10, 20 years. If I do these things and I, and I really, why do, what do I want? That's what I want. What I want my business to be, what I want my health to be, my relationships. And you visualize the why. And then just like I did with my first job, you, you work backwards and your brain will figure it out. And you think, well, if I don't do these things in five or 10 years or 20 years, what is my life going to look like? And it, you can cut. The nice thing about that exercise is we in human, as human beings, can really be hard on ourselves. And it's really easy to visualize the negative. And so for me, it just was taking some of these tools that have been recognized. If you take the time to pause and come up with the why and what do I want and then work backwards, man, it can change everything. So yeah, that, that's, that's really powerful. And I'm, 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 I, I couldn't help but think of something that I've, uh, based so much of my professional life on for the past 20 years um, as a professional salesperson where I don't, you know, if I'm qualifying a sales opportunity, I have to, it's easy to talk about what happens if you buy the thing, right? The product, the service, whatever. But unless I can identify something bad that happens if they don't buy it, I don't have a qualified opportunity. And so as you're talking and I try to teach my, 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 my team, the same thing, you have to know what happens if they don't act. And what you're, you're suggesting is the polar opposite of how we typically think, right? If I do these things, good will follow, right? Yes. But if I don't do them, Oh, okay. That's, that's a different level of motivation all together. So I, I think that's a, that's a really powerful message. And we'll be sure to link the, the Tony Robbins information. Yeah, in the they, show notes. 
one of the most powerful things he does this program is called unleash the power within it's the first it's the first set but it is a you know i again i you know went up and got certified as a hypnosis this guy is the master and if you really want to change yourself really what it is he's baking it there's a it's not called the cunningham method but there's some method it's like a an hour and a half group hypnosis thing where he basically walks you through these various spheres of your life for you and yourself you do some homework and then he walks you through it and and tony's such a powerful presence he puts you in what he calls state which is basically this place where you're ready to be open to this there's a physical component where you're moving your body again it until you go through, I just suggest to anyone, it's kind of like, you know, when you're a kid tasting beer, beer for the first time or scotch, just go with it, just taste it, right? Or sushi for the first time. But at the end of this hour and a half, if you're not changed, man, I, I, I think they even say, look, we'll give you your money back. I mean, it's that. An hour about. and a half. That's it. Well, I mean, no, no, no. That's just <laughs> one. That That's that's after like two or three days working up. They put you through exercises to get you into this place where you're thinking about your life in terms of what you want very very tangibly it's like taking that napoleon hill book and bringing it to life and putting in putting it into chroma you know 3d on the big screen and letting you walk into it and just step into it and just you know it's just transformative and i think for uh for young people especially to to have the opportunity because institutionally we're never taught to think about our lives and how to not just make goals, but even how to make goals, right? And then what what does that mean? And what goals to make for and to-do lists? No, we, we, we think more in terms of metaphor and visual. And so you create this story for yourself and, and, and in a way that you believe it, because if you don't believe it, it ain't gonna work. But once you believe, that you can do this. Once I believe that I can get my health back in order, I can really have incredibly great relationships. And look, it's not all perfect. It's a process, but I just, I think it's game changing. And so even if you don't do that and just read the Napoleon Hill book and, and not just create goals, but create them in, in terms of what do I want out of it, then everything starts to flow. So you, you think, which I, I've never thought of this before, but even for someone who's, you know, like 20 years old, you think it would benefit by going to a Tony Robbins class? I, I, I was so enthralled with this. I've got two kids who um, are, you know, just kind of about to go into the work. Uh, My daughter is about to graduate from law school and my son has just started as a real estate agent and I am paying for them to go to the live Tony Robbins event Mm. in uh, Miami. And, you know, again, I, I say that with some trepidation because I know if someone had told me that before, I, I did it for a very specific purpose. I wanted to understand who this guy was and how he was doing it from a perspective of my, my personal craft as a trial lawyer. I want to know how he's using NLP and hypnosis in a group setting to influence people. That's why okay, it's I went a crazy out. concept, right? I mean, we, we, you know, it almost seems uh, hard to believe that. Yeah. They- and so I kind of went, I just want to see it like I'm the ultimate skeptic. And I went and walked away. And what I realized, it was just, it was Napoleon Hill on steroids and and teaching these basic lessons that we should be teaching all young people. So I I wonder why it's not more prevalent because I have some some, friends and business associates who've gone to uh, similar immersive programs like that. And and without exception, almost people will come away from those things feeling as if it's a life-changing experience as, as you've described it. And so that, that, it, that can't be coincidence. It, there ha- it has no. to be very real. Well, there are two studies. There's one, I can't remember who did it, but of Dale Carnegie, right? Dale Carnegie was this other guy that talked about influence. His seminal book was how to win friends and influence people. Sure. And my dad gave me that book as a high school student and I read it. And I, that's the other book that I have multiple copies on my shelf. My, my daughter's boyfriend, he wanted to go to lunch and he just graduated from law school, picked my brain. So I gave him two books. I gave him Napoleon Hill in that one. Um, but um, I, lo- I totally lost, lost my, my, my track, but. Um, well, we were, we were talking about, it's not, it's not coincidence that people come away from Oh it. yeah, yeah, yeah. So two studies. So there's one that studied Dale Carnegie grads and their relative success in business mm. compared to like the baseline. 
And there's some people who say, oh, well, but those are people who are motivated to actually improve themselves. Okay, maybe, but it can't explain the disparity, whether it's right or wrong, geometrically greater performance, geometrically greater income, geometrically greater success for the people that just went to a Dale Carnegie course. But I'd suggest that it's because it's taking a step back and letting us learn how, teaching us how to be more successful uh, beyond just, you know, going to business classes in, in undergrad or going and getting an MBA. We're never taught those human skills. And this Tony Robbins thing, there was another, there was a Stanford study that studied, he's got another course called Date with Destiny. And it really goes deep on forcing you to ask and trying to find the answer is, what are my values? And from those values, what is my purpose? What is my mission? And what, what do I want? And it's super duper powerful because it just, it's a, it's a chance to pause, to hit the pause button with a really powerful mentor guide and get you into this state in this place where you can be introspective and have the space to try to understand this. And that's the ultimate question, right? The what, what do I want out of life? And then to put meat on the bones. And so they took and they looked at the people that had done date with destiny and they actually sent some people that were clinically depressed. And it was actual study that Stanford University did. And then they looked at the efficacy of that group compared to another group that didn't go through it. And the numbers are just like astonishing. And so something that is kind of pseudoscience and, and maybe it's placebo, whatever it might be, but I'm just suggesting that it works. And if you want to get motivated, doing things like thinking about your life, finding a North Star and steering towards it with a hand on your rudder and understanding why you're on that course. Why am I sailing in this direction? How am I going to navigate the shoals now? And, and knowing that, golly, if the wind comes up or I get a shoal or I get a storm, whatever it may be, I may have to adjust the course, but I still kind of know where I'm going. And yeah, I think it, 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 everything you're saying, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's, I think there's, it's not just one reason probably, because to me, it signifies commitment. Yes. Anything else. Are you willing to go to those courses and spend the time, spend the money? Uh, that's a huge commitment in and of itself, right? Yes. And are you willing to do what others aren't, right? The Jerry Rice quote, um, which he says, that's, that's why he was successful because he was willing to do what others would not do. And I think that is all part of the same message. So then, yes, getting exposure to, to those lessons, getting exposure to the guidance and advice is, is, you know, is, is all part of it, but you have to commit first. Right? Yeah, but yes. let's, let's look at the real cost of that. So we've talked about this before. How much does it cost, now you may get scholarships, to go and get a four-year undergraduate education in terms of opportunity cost, you know, if you're going to go out and just get a job, in terms of tuition, books, expenses, living expenses, whatever. Let's just say it's a hundred grand, right? Round number, sure. Okay, hundred grand, and four years of your life. Okay, and granted, you learn some, but that's where most people's education ends. And I think that this goes back to your question: is you know, the notion of hard work. But it's not just hard work; it's working smarter and working on yourself too. Because that's what a lot of us focus on is like, what am I going to do at work? What are my goals at work? How am I going to be a better salesperson? How am I going to convert more leads? Build a, but that's just method. We don't talk about yourself, which is the most important part of this. They don't teach you about yourself and psychology and business. They don't teach you how and what kinds of, not just goal setting, but, but creating your purpose. You don't get educated. You're given this bullshit education yeah you learn maybe learn some accounting and some finance and whatever you're learning in undergrad and you're gonna learn some humanities and generally get a piss poor education if you go to a state university and then you're just kind of cast out expecting to go find a job and go to work it's nonsense and so my suggestion for my children is like this and whatever it may be whatever self-improvement you get but a, a, a perspective to help you figure out what do i want and how am I going to get there? That's the ultimate lesson. So at least for me, one way of doing it that I think is very successful is to go to a Robbins event, but it's a chance to step back and be introspective. It could be as easy as reading a couple books on this stuff, read Napoleon Hill, take three days, go sit somewhere at on the beach or on your back porch, 
shut off the internet, shut off the phone, get out a yellow pad and map this shit out and mean it and, and figure out a way, what do I want and how am I gonna get there? And that's something we don't teach, we don't do. And I think once, once you figure that out for yourself, at least it did for me. And I think if we go back to pattern recognition, looking at other people who are great, they've done the same thing, they've had a mission, and then the work and the method comes naturally because you're not working. You are, you are getting out of bed to build, to create, to give back. And holy crap, there's the real one, right? Uh, and without question. I mean, wow, it, we can it, figure out how to do something and give back. You know, most, of, most of the good ideas that I've had have, have come when I'm not at work, right? <laughs> because when you're at work, you're dealing in the moment, you're dealing That's with it. the task at hand. I, 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 yeah, I, I have much better thoughts when I'm out running, but because I am, I'll say passion. I try to avoid using that word because it's so cliche, but I'm so interested in, in what it is that I do and, and to uh, you know, be successful doing it. That, that is my thought when I'm not at work. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm always at work to some degree because of that. And I, and I want that for the people I care about. I want them to find something that they're willing to put forth that time and effort into, because as you said earlier, and it's not work at all, right? It's, it's just a means to an end that you're getting, you know, if you can, if you can do it without um, having, you know, the, 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 the financial reward in mind or any specific reward other than you, the benefit of doing it and, and how it makes you feel right. I mean, I think that's, that's a really powerful thing. If you can, if you can find it. I mean, but you yeah, have to I, I, and I wouldn't call it passion either. I'd call it, what do I want? Let's be brutally selfish with this. What do I want? And, and put it down on paper and be as tangible as I can. And then if you get what you want, then you're happy. And if you get it all, well, hopefully you're happy. But if I got what I want, then I can figure it out from there. What do I want next? And what do I want next? Well, it's, 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 it's the truest thing that you have, which I, I think, right? If you, if you say, what, what is it that it consumes your thoughts? Yes. You know, no one else can determine that for you. You may not even be able, you may not be willing to articulate it to anyone else for various reasons, right? Depending right. on what those thoughts are. But that is your true self. That is yes. your true interest and motivation and drive. And if and if you you if you can match those things up, amazing things can happen. And and I don't I don't know that amazing things can happen without it, right? But but you know, maybe, but that should be when I think of if career zen right that that's it what is that thing that consumes your thoughts um because you're so you you you, you it's so interesting to you um it's so uh um it's just all encompassing i mean that that is what i would wish for anyone who's young in their career that's for sure right i didn't have that far from it i was i was lost you found it at a young age you achieve success not really. I didn't. Well, I kind of found what I was good at and that brought me happiness, but I didn't really find my purpose until I was in my mid thirties, mm. but at least I was following what I thought I was good at. And it was kind of fun. And I kind of, you know, it was kind of like playing a sport, right? Going into a courtroom and talking to a jury and it's a contest. You're going up against another lawyer who's trying to take you out. It's kind of fun. I mean, but you have to play for me. Way. Right. If you didn't see it that way, you wouldn't yeah. have put forth the effort. You wouldn't have right. you wouldn't have put that grind forward. Right. You could have avoided that at all costs and right. still done the job. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could have checked the box, but checking the box isn't isn't going to isn't going to achieve a high level of success. We know that. Right. You're right. And so, um, man, this has been this has been really good. I I I I I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I do have to ask you one final question, though. Sure. Have you found career zen? Because I'm not sure if you have. I ask everyone that. Um, it's a very personal thing, right? That whatever that means to you. But you said you found your wife. I don't know that you found it yet. You seem no, so no, no, no. It's, it's, it's yeah. So ultimately, at the end of the day, my passion is getting to play Robin Hood, to give to the poor, the the people who really need it, who've been screwed over by big corporations, and take from the wealthy people who've screwed them over, and to help them. And to not just, and, and really if I had to encapsulate it, is to get extraordinary record-breaking verdicts and settlements 
to people who've been wronged or hurt or have suffered losses. That gives me joy. And I've been able to done it to do it in a way that has been fulfilling not only for my clients, but I think it's made the world safer. We've had some of the biggest recalls in history, I think, as a part, not just my cases, but other people, you know, the, the Takata recall and the Ford Firestone recall and a, and a host of other recalls of products that you've probably never heard of that have had an impact on regular people, real people, families and children beyond just the clients that I've represented. And so now I look at this thing and, you know, do I want to retire and go hike around the world or sail? I've figured that out over the last couple of years. And so this whole sort of exciting new thing is to um, we created a not for profit uh, five years ago called trial school, and we have over 5000 members and we basically provide free trial advocacy training for other lawyers who only represent human beings. So if you represent a corporation or a business or the government, you are not allowed in our group, Hmm. but we hold these amazing seminars, we have an online platform it's all free and we give it away and we've, I think, made especially the lawyers who need it the most and can't afford it. Uh, especially in, you know, uh, small practices, people who've left the, the public defenders or the prosecutors, the young lawyers trying to start out who were where I was when I was on my own. Helping those people help other people has been great. And then also kind of how can I grow my firm? Because one of the things that I see, at least in my industry, that makes me really angry is the same thing that made me jump sides years ago, which is crappy lawyers, a lot of whom are the billboard lawyers that you see, these mills, these advertisers, these TV lawyers who have um, lawyers who have way too many cases. They may be decent lawyers, but way too many cases. They got them. It's like a mill. They're moving these cases and these poor clients sign up with the because they don't know any of the lawyers. They go to these giant firms and they are settling their cases or having their cases settled by these lawyers for pennies on the dollars. And that really, really pisses me off. Uh, on so many levels. And so one of the things we're looking at now is, all right, well, how can we change that? How can I be a change agent with that? Um, And we've got some creative things, but I think that's kind of my next phase is to work even within my industry because my ultimate mission for me is is getting extraordinary results for the people who really need it, human beings. Uh, And and man, that's just, that's a rush. And so I'll probably be doing it, you know, till they cart me out. That's a great legacy to leave. No question. Yeah. But, so. Well, uh, so I'll take that as a, as a, as a, as a maybe then it's still a work in progress. You're still at it, which is. Oh, no, no. It's a definitely, I am, I am, I am in this thing for the duration. That's my clarity. Now there's, there's, there's no maybe about it. Plus I have a kid in law school who's, who's kind of got the same passion I do. And that's a whole different level of leaving a legacy and, and having fun with her and mentoring her. So. Yeah, so I'm I'm in this thing for the duration. I'm 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 having fun. Awesome. Well, thank you again. I, I really appreciate your time. It, it, you know, I'm I really enjoyed getting to read your bio today. I, I didn't read much of it, but um, I I read it prior, and uh, I I you know I know you 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 how accomplished you are, but to see it in print, uh, it's impressive. So um, again, thank you, thank you for all your time today. Very proud of your success. Well, thanks for what you're doing for all the people out there. I I hope that some of the people that listen to this, I've given so many of those damn uh, books out, the the Napoleon Hill and the Dale Carnegie. I hope someone just takes the time and hears this. If one person would just take this advice is invest in yourself and, and take the time and give yourself some space to find what lights you up. And it's a journey and you're not gonna maybe find it right away, but if you work on it and, and give it a significant investment of your time into it, I promise you it will make all of the difference. Awesome. Powerful words. Rich, thank you. All right. Thank Have you. Have a great rest of the day. And thank, thank you for truly listening. A, it was truly a pleasure and an honor being on your uh, podcast. I well, really, really enjoyed it. Maybe we'll get you back on in a year and follow up on uh, all right. what's happened, to, uh, happened since. But um, good. thank you again. And thanks everyone for listening. And we will talk to you very soon. All right, Pete. Thanks again. So how was that?